Welcome to Labor's View. I'm David Weiner, President of Local 1081 of the Communications Workers of America, known, commonly known as CWA. And I'm president of the union that represents the some 600 or so non-supervisory employees of the SS County Division of Welfare. They are very hard and dedicated working people. And I'm going to explain to you tonight some of the problems that they have that affect them personally, also that affect their clients, and that affect the general public. One of the biggest issues we have is the problem of staffing, or the lack of staffing. Our agency has or services one out of every five individuals, every five residents of the County of Essex. Let's think about it again. One out of every five people, theoretically, that you see walking around in the County of Essex is a client of the Division of Welfare. And that's not just in the urban areas, like the Newark and East Orange and Irvington, as people would like to think, but that's in the suburbs as well. Livingston, Roseland, West Orange, uh, Caldwell's everywhere because we have food stamps, we have Medicaid, we have uh, TANF which is for families with children, we have GA, general assistance, single individuals without children. So we service so many people that we are the largest welfare agency in the state of New Jersey and the eighth largest in the country and our staffing numbers are far, far lower than they should be. Now, here's a reason why. In 1999, then County Executive Republican Treppinger had an arrangement with then Republican Governor of the state of New Jersey, Christy Todd Whitman. And that arrangement was within, between the years of 1999 and 2000, one time for each year. The state gave the county money in advance for staffing levels for the Division of Welfare. 6.5 million one year and I think 8.5 the other year. The total came up to about 15 million dollars. That money was put directly into the treasury of the County of Essex. And I said at the time in an article in the Star Ledger where I was quoted and Ken Executive was quoted, I said at the time this money it's like Robin Hood in, in, in reverse. This money belongs to the employees to have enough employees to service the clients of the Division of Welfare. And I was assured at the time in the article by the county executive that as soon as possible those monies would be taken from the Treasury and repaid to the Division of Welfare. Well, let's fast forward 13 years. What happens every single year now is a game. The game is the state of New Jersey, quote unquote, loans or forwards to the division, the Essex County Division of Welfare, fifteen million dollars. The same fifteen million dollars that they took from us in 1999 and 2000. And in exchange for that, we're supposed to maintain a minimum level of 822 employees. Now, in the last nine years, because I did an Open Public Records Act request. And I found out that that means where you get information from the government. And I found out in those, in the last past nine years, from 2002 to 2011, the Division of Welfare exceeded, met, or exceeded that 822 minimum once. Only once. All the other times, the staffing levels were in the 700s. So that violates an annual agreement that the, that the county has with the state and it is keeping that $15 million from the Division of Welfare. The other problem is, at the end of each year, the administration and the freeholders, the county executive and the freeholders, legislative, political, they cancel monies that are appropriated budgetarily in January of that particular year. And each year, the Division of Welfare, and we're not the only ones, other divisions have had monies canceled as well. But each year, the Division of Welfare has had hundreds of thousands, if not millions, sometimes millions of dollars canceled that were appropriated for staffing. What does that mean? It means not only did we not reach that 822 minimum number of staffing, but money that could have been spent on staffing was not spent. 
and millions of dollars of other funding that could have been spent on uh, hard equipment, uh, printers that we don't have. So people have to wait in line for printers. All this is being done. Now, we get so annoyed because I talked about uh, attention being paid to the western part of the county, particularly to the zoo. I know if you watched this show before, you've seen me take the county executive on a lot about the overattention that he pays to the zoo. And not only in terms of monies, which are often a combination of Green Acres monies from the state and also, also monies from the county. That's a one and a half percent tax on everybody that works or lives in the county. And sometimes it's actually bonded, money that borrowed from the, by the county, such as the McLuhan's restaurant that's up in West Orange at the zoo where uh, millions, I believe $9 million, was borrowed by the county to set up a, to set up a restaurant for a, a private restaurant owner who has restaurants all over the state. Very successful restaurants, by the way. So every time we see a McLuhan's be set up, or a rope exhibit, or a Gibbons Ape exhibit, or, and it's not just the money that's spent, it's also the time and the energy because people are pulled out for PR, public relations, and all this type of stuff. And I've said, I did, I did an open request, and I said to the county executive, Tell, look at all these press releases that you've done. And I counted over that past year where I started the, the open request. Out of some, I don't know, scores and scores of press releases, maybe one had to do with the issue of poverty. None with the Division of Welfare, just one with the issue of poverty, and that had to do with homelessness. So that's, that's a major problem. But our, our history of dealing with government, our union's history, is one of stridency. It always has been, at least since I became president some 32 years ago. And a lot of our members are relatively new because there's been turnover, because people age out of the system, they retire, and they, they don't know about the history of their own local. So we've been showing them articles that were in the Star-Ledger where we took over 100 members to a Milburn Town Committee meeting because one of the committee people was also a major employee of then County Executive Treffinger who said that they wanted to experiment with the civil service system, which would have meant making the guarantees of job security less for our members. For years later, I was told by somebody who I know worked in the police department, I'm talking about many years later, the chief of police still cringes, or maybe he did it, maybe he's retired since then, but he cringed when he heard my name, which I take as a compliment. We also led a coalition when the county executive, Travenger, um, decided that he was going to do a retroactive residency resolution, meaning that everybody, all the employees of the county, within one year of that resolution had to move to the county if they didn't live there or they lose their jobs. And we said, hold it, hold it, hold it. This, re this resolution has been in place since 1978 when the government changed the form of government from just freeholders to the freeholder county executive. So you're meaning to tell us that you're going to say that everybody's been hired at that time over some 20 years and lived either began in, in, living in Essex County and then moved to other places because they were allowed to, that they're going to have to sell their homes, move their families, take their kids out of schools, and move to Essex County because you make this edict. He said yes, and we said no. So we took a coalition of unions, our brother and sister unions within the county, the IBW, the PBAs the, for the police and, and the, civil, the, um, the correctional officers, and we got an attorney and we took them to court, and we sued, and we won. And the deal was, going forward from that date, anyone hired after that date would have to be a resident of the county, but nobody before that date. And then years and le years later, under Joe DiVincenzo, we have an arrangement contractually, I say we, it's all the unions, that you have to live in the county when you first get hired for up to five years, and then if you want to move out, you may. So that's one of our major battles. We also had one that Treffinger, my good friend Jim, uh, he's actually a good guy, and I, I, and I know him pretty well, even though he had some problems. As many of you know, uh, while kind of executive, he actually had to go to jail for a little while. Um, he decided that 
he was going to have a bill sponsored that would allow for the privatization of one county welfare agency out of the 21 county welfare agencies in the entire state of New Jersey. And that one just happened to be the Essex County Division of Welfare. Well, we got a group of black clergy and politicians, including Reverend Reginald Jackson, including uh, the lately and dearly departed State Senator Winona Lippman, and we formed that coalition and we got a halt to that legislation. We had yet another what I called Jim's January surprises, which they always didn't happen in January. They were usually within the first three months of the, of the year. He concocted something to attack public employees. It kind of reminds you of, uh, at least me and others, of the current governor and his attack upon the public employees of New Jersey, where out of the blue, the county executive said that everyone in the county, including himself, I think, I think he included himself, but everybody in the county had to write an essay to him. It sounds funny. I see my producer laughing, but it happened to be true. That everyone had to write an essay justifying why they should keep their jobs. Or he would move against them. Of course, that would be a lot to move because then we got to go through the civil service process and we, we were able to hearings and attorneys and everything. But this is what he came out with, and we were able to stop that that genius idea. And then one other major thing we have with that administration was that our union and our sister union, PESU, which is really an association, the Public Employees uh, Supervisors Union, they represent the, the uh, managers and supervisors of the agency. Jim wanted to move us into a, a building that used to be owned by United Hospitals in, in East Orange at 50 uh, South Clinton Street, right by 280. And my, my uh, at time peer, uh, he and I looked at it and we said, this building is horrible. This is not set up for the number of people you want to put in there because it wouldn't be just the division welfare. That would have been at the time just the first floor. That would be the food stamp office. Then we are also talking about the third and fourth floors were going to be welfare to work, which is another department. Also taxation was in there and the second floor was leased out to the State Department of Labor. Now in you know, in a sense, the concept made sense, which is redundant, but, but true, different words of sense, that you wanted to have a one-stop shopping for people that were going for welfare services or welfare-to-work services or a Department of Labor getting jobs through the Department of Labor. But you picked a bill, they picked a building with two very narrow fire escapes, uh, uh, internal stair stairways, that it was so poorly uh, designed and built and uh, outfitted that one day, a winter day, the during a, 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 I believe it was a very hard rainstorm, the entire electrical system went out. The backup electrical system did not power on. So you had a five-story building that went completely dark, composed of employees, women and children, men and not children employees, but men and, 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 and women servicing children including. Uh, you had the dis disabled, elderly, all having to feel their ways down using whatever little flashlights or lighters they had to exit the building. So we're constantly, constantly monitoring that building which we're still in for health and safety issues. The most recent one being that two locks in the food stamp office that went from the client area, or the general area, into the secure area where the workers are, where they had the case records, which are confidential information. Two of those locks remained broken for up to a month. The day that I filed the grievance, which I believe was January 6th of this of uh, last no, this year, of 13, that evening, when our people left, they were fixed. But these are the. This is just some of the history that our our locals have has had. Uh, that doesn't count the time I took a rat, a dead rat, to a free elder board meeting when we had a, the, old, the old food stamp office in, 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 on Broad Street in Newark. Uh, we had actual rats that had been poisoned by the landlords, but they were huge. They were, looked like huge cats, and they were drugged by the poison so that in the daytime when rats would never come out, because they're afraid of humans, they would actually walk down the aisles or one actually came out of the desk when somebody opened the drawer. So I said to the guy who ran the building, who wasn't even aligned with us, 
He said, do me a favor. When you, next one you find, give me a call. He called me. Those are the days of the beepers. That's how long ago it was. He beat me. I went over there. Before I did, I went to McCrory's. I bought a, a uh, orange juice dispenser. I couldn't find anything, like an apothecary jar, and some regular alcohol. And he and I picked it up with something, not that we're touching it, put it in, filled it in, went to the field war meeting, plopped it on the banners, and I said, this is what's in your building. That's when we were moved out of there, and we've gotten out of these buildings. So that's the history, some of the history, of our local under my leadership with the battles we've had to fight, which unfortunately our members and a lot of the public either don't remember or weren't there for them. New battles come along every single day. The latest issue we're dealing with is what they call the Modernization Committee of the Division of Welfare that things have to, be be, have to be done better. Because what happened is the state of New Jersey, the Department of Human Services, has been in contact and has written letters to uh, our administration, both at the county executive level and the Division of Welfare Leadership, and her boss, the Department Director of Citizen Services, saying that you're, you don't have enough staff. Well, I told you that story already. We already know that. And therefore, what's happening is people are, clients are not getting serviced in a in timely fashion. They're not getting uh, notifications that they're denied, so they don't know what their status is. We had one situation where our intake unit was being told by their managers that get, when a client comes in, you give them a letter and say, you come back 58 days later to, to take an application for assistance. The federal law says you have to take the application and make a decision either that they're eligible or illegible in 30 days. So we went to the state, complained about that, and that was rectified because of what we had to do to fight. So what the county did is I, they hired a company called Janus Solutions, whom they've used before for welfare to work issues. It's a private company. And they held a steering committee meeting of a group of people from the agency, from the state, uh, some politicians when they showed up or didn't want to show up. And I kind of forced my way on. And we, worked, we met for 90 days, and they came up with a plan. Well, one of those plans that we're very concerned about is what they call a case banking system. And I won't get into the details of it. We, have, we haven't started it yet, but it's something we'll tell you now that in future shows you may very well see us revealing as being deleterious to the best interests of not only the clients but of the employees as well because it's a design that makes everyone responsible for nothing and no one responsible for everything, if that makes any sense at all. We also had another little situation because of staffing levels and because of some historical issues where I told you we have Medicaid cases. And they are for people for medical coverage. And we also service the, the elderly and we also service uh, people with disabilities. Well, by law, they have to have what's known as a recertification or a certification. Once they're on the system, a year later, it's either every six months or every year, they have to be recertified. In other words, they have to come in, or we go to them if they're not well enough, and show you their documents and see if their financial circumstances have changed to either make them more or less eligible than they had been or exactly the same. Well, it came to light that because of the processes and because we didn't have the staffing, our agency developed 72,000 overdue recerts. I'll repeat that, 72,000 overdue re recertifications, which now we're trying to clean up. Now, what does that mean? That means a numbers, hundreds, if not thousands of people that were not eligible for Medicaid could have been paid Medicaid because no one checked out the circumstances. Or conversely, people that were eligible for it or to have it increased may not have gotten it or it might have been cut off entirely because no one did the recertification. So again, we're watching and yes, we're complaining, but again, it's constructive, as I, was, as I said in the beginning of the show, for our members, because that's what we do, we're the union, for our clients and for the general public because you and we, because we pay taxes up as well, we are all paying for it. And not just in money, but in the way it impacts our society in terms of how people live. 
We had a little issue which everybody in the state of New Jersey who works here had. That is when the, the changes to the tax laws uh, in New Jersey, there was a moratorium on Social Security so that the Social Security tax actually went up. So people saw, doesn't matter how much you made, anywhere between 50 to $70 per pay less in their pay. Now, that's on top of, for public employees such as we, that are in the state pension system and who have our health benefits paid by our employer, our percentages to the two years ago, the kind of, uh, the, uh, Governor Christie and, and, and uh, State Senator Sweeney and the county executive Joe DiVincenzo and his legislative people that he controls, they all got together and they said, we have a pension system that's not sustainable. Why isn't it s sustainable? Well, because the state was not paying into the system, even though they were supposed to by law. Because the system had been doing so well because of the stock market up to 2008, they said, well, why pay into it? It's, it's flush with cash. We'll put that someplace else. Then when the stock market crash happened, what happened? All of a sudden, now there's not enough money in the system. So what do they say? Well, the, the workers now, even though you've been paying into it all the time, we're going to increase it by 2%. You're, what you have to pay by 2%. That's not the worst of it. The worst of it is when they said, you know what? The health costs are going up and up and up in this country, and public employees are not paying enough of their share. So they say the private, in the private sector, a lot of companies don't even offer health insurance. Or if they do, the employee has to pay, pay a, a large percentage of their salary for their plans. So what they say to us, they said, instead of paying 1.5% of your actual salary, you're now going to pay a percentage based upon how much you make of what your employer actually pays for your health benefits. Someone making uh, $60,000 a year, which is a max that people can make in our agency, Division of Welfare, about 60, 61,000. It may sound like a lot to some people, but I'm talking after making 30 or 40 years, that's all you're making is $60,000 a year. Where in some counties, they're making 80, 90,000, doing a job with fewer people. But okay, you're gonna pay, you are paying about $800 per year for your health benefits. With this change in this law that I talked about, that happened two summers ago, you're now going to, depending on how much you make and how long you've been there and what plan you're in, the quality of the plan from the highest to the lowest. If let's say you're in the premier plan, which they call traditional, you're going to go from paying $800 a year to now up to between six and $8,000 per year. And there's no end to it. Because even though the law sunsets this coming year, meaning that no more increases will come unless you negotiate them with, with your respective employer, Every year, your employer has a health care company, in our case, it's Aetna, with whom they do business. And every year, and except for one year I've seen in 32 years of being president, every year, the amount of money that health care company charges the employer, the county, goes up. So you're paying more every single year on top of that. It could get to the point where you could be virtually working for nothing. If you look between taxes and everything else, you're working for very, very little money. And this is the way the system's even up. You've got politicians who want to foist it all upon the public sector because the public sector is unionized to the greatest ex extent. And the private sector has become less and less unionized. So what happened? In the private sector, as the unions disappeared because the jobs went overseas, because things became automated, because corporations got larger and stronger and started forcing unions out or keeping them out, what happened is instead of being rep represented by a union that could collectively bargain for you and get the best deal, because in strength there's numbers, instead, the individual was left on his or her own. And so they got into situations where they had to start paying for their health benefits if they had them at all. And they had, went from a defined pension benefit, which thank goodness we still have, which means you have like the public employee system, pe uh, pension system, where you have a system where you pay a certain amount in over the years, and when it's done, you get a certain amount based upon your years of service and your salary and your age, and that's how much you're going to get as you, as you, uh, as you retire, after you retire. But with the, with the other way, they force you into 401Ks. Well, if you remember the president at the time, President Bush, George Bush, the last one, his great idea was 
to put everybody should, what, that wants to should go into 401ks. And I said, it would be great for the young people. They can do what they want with their money. They can invest it they want. They have to be, be, be waiting for the, and relied upon the government to make that decision. Well, then came 2008 crash. And those 401ks lost half of their value on average. And a lot of people, senior people that were relying upon that, had all of a sudden now how to go, had to go out and get jobs, sell their homes, get these reverse mortgages that you see Henry Winkler and everybody else selling on TV, which is really just a Ponzi scheme to, to take you, give you a loan on your house, and eventually you won't own your house anymore. You just keep on taking the money from the bank or the company, and eventually they own the house and then they sell the house. So that's another a big issue that we've been fighting. Superstorm Sandy caused havoc throughout the state of New Jersey, particularly in the shore area where I happen to live and where we're, we're taping now in, in Monmouth County. Luckily, we didn't have the damage that we did under Irene. Irene, we had a tree fall on our roof uh, the day after the storm was over. But we're fine. But my sister-in-law, who's, who's retired from the agency, she had to be rescued and her whole family by boat in Belmar and still is in a rented house because her house was flooded with water up to half of the first floor. So the question was, on three days on Sandy the, during the storm and the three days that followed, but the employees couldn't go to work. No, they, nobody could really go to work throughout the entire state, virtually, except for emergency responders. And we actually had to fight by filing grievances to keep the administration of the county, not just we, all the employees, to keep them from trying to charge us for those three days where we could not get to work if we wanted to get to work. But we prevailed and they, they didn't. There are issues such as, I mentioned security locks at the food stamp office. Well, the food stamp office is strange because that's the one of 50 South Clinton Street that's owned by the county. That's when we opposed from the beginning. And they, they have about five or six sheriff's offices there because there's a lot, there's lots of people. Not a lot more necessarily than at 18 Rector Street, our other building, but there's a lot of people. The, they have a new security company, which they, every time the contract comes up, they get the, the lowest bidder rather than looking at the, 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 uh, the um, lowest responsible bidder. But I looked at the actual resolution and I wrote a letter to the county executive on January 2nd, uh, January 2nd, because there's a 17,760, uh, I'm sorry, 17,769 dollar difference between the cost that the county said when they first put it out to what actually was costing the county, which was over, over a million dollars. So we have many, many other issues that we deal with on an every, everyday basis for our members, for our clients, and if I hope you can see, for all of the, not only residents of Estes County, but of our entire nation, because they affect everyone one way or another. So for the members of CWA Local 1081, I'm David Weiner, president of the local, and we thank you for joining us for Labor's View, and we hope to see you on future shows. Job. No, it is not hard.